standing for a reading from God's Word. This from Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. The Word of the Lord says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. This is the word of God. You may be seated. I want you to imagine that you're in the first century. Maybe you're even in the city of Ephesus where this letter is written. You're coming to church that morning. You get there. You've got your coffee in hand, right? And this particular Sunday is unique. You hear there's a man named Tychicus that has come. And Tychicus has brought a letter and personal updates from the Apostle Paul. And so maybe Tychicus or possibly one of the leaders in the church would stand up and would read what we now know to be the book of Ephesians to the entire congregation. And as he comes to what we know as the beginning of chapter 6, something unexpected happens. He's been talking about spirit-filled living, right, all the way back in Ephesians 5, verse 18. He tells us, be filled with the Spirit. This is a continual call to be filled with God's Spirit and let Him overflow out of our life. And we see that the primary place the Spirit's filling works itself out is in what the commentators call the household codes. That what it means to be filled with the Spirit is not that you can put on a good face at church or even put on a good face out in public. What makes someone filled with the Spirit is who they are and how they live behind closed doors, particularly with their family. He addresses believers in general. Last week we saw what he had to say to husbands and to wives. And then we read these words, Ephesians 6, 1. This would have been before the whole congregation. They would have read, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And I'm sure at that moment all the parents erupted in applause. <laughs> Giving went through the roof that Sunday. Revival broke out in the streets, right? But on a more realistic note, isn't it incredible that God's Word is concerned with children? Of all the issues that can be addressed in the world, God has not forgotten about the preciousness and importance of children. And they were tempted in the first century, just as we are in the 21st century, to think of children as a burden rather than as a blessing. Now, the word translated children here is actually a very general word. It, it can refer to children without necessarily a reference to age. Paul uses this throughout the letter to talk about how we're children of God. It actually is used, you can write this reference down if you're curious, in Luke 2.48 of Jesus when he's a 12-year-old at the temple. And interestingly enough, it's not the word that's in Mark chapter 10 where Jesus says, let the little children come unto me. So I think the children he has in view here are those who are old enough to have made a profession of faith, old enough to understand Paul's command, and even likely old enough to have been members of the body of Christ. This is a letter to the whole church, and Paul basically has a tiny section to the student ministry, <laughs> to the young people, to the youths, right, the next generation. And he doesn't address them as the future of the church, but if they're believers in Christ, they are the present church. And what's so important about children and young people that Paul would write to them and to us by extension? He really wants to answer the question, what do children need? What do young people need in their life? And he gives five things that every young person, regardless of age, needs. But I think he wants us to put that focus in particular on those who are old enough to begin to understand and to engage and to apply these things. First, he says that children need 
the church. Children need the church. It's important to see that in the background of all of this is a family of faith. Remember, this is a letter to the church that is in Ephesus. And they were assuming that these young people had a part to play in the church. Yes, children need their biological families, but friends, they also need their faith family. This is why this sermon is so important to you. Today, if you're an adult here, or maybe you don't have children yet, or maybe your children are out of the house and you're like, great, I can turn my brain off. This isn't a sermon for me. No, friends. You have children around you in the body of Christ. You have children over which you can either be a good or a bad influence around you. So this is a sermon for all of us because we all have a role to play in the lives of the young people around us. Here's some fascinating research from LifeWay published last year that students and young people who were invested in by Christian adults outside of and alongside of their parents were more likely to continue in the faith into college and adulthood. Here's part of that study. The odds of a teenager dropping out, which is dropping out of church, right, after they get out of the house or once they become old enough to drive and do all those things, the odds of a teenager dropping out who said three or more adults at church invested in them between the ages of 15 and 18 is 1.35 times lower than those who had only one or two adults invested in them. Even more dramatically, the odds of those who had three or more adults investing in them are 2.6 times lower than those who had no adults investing in them at church during those ages. Now, it's been a while since I had my, my college stats class. And really, the only thing I learned in my college stats class is that I can't trust a single statistic I read. That was about what I drew coming out of class. But here's what this says, and what this study seems to show as they interviewed these young people, that having multiple Christian adults invested in them, particularly in those key years of, of formation and, and maturity and growth, they can be nearly three times less likely to step away from the community of faith when they get independence if they have people pouring into their life now. Again, I don't have to have a degree in stats to say that your child needs relationships with other godly adults in the body for it all to stick. They say it takes a village to raise a child, when actuality, friends, it takes a church to raise a Christian. It takes the people of God pouring into the young people as the young people are integrated into the body of Christ. They need to be invested in by godly, faithful adults alongside their parents. Titus chapter 2 really offers us a vision for this. Look what Titus, uh, what Paul wrote to Titus. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith and love and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, uh, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves of much wine. They're to teach what is good. And so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the young men to be self-controlled. In other words, he says, church, older men, older women, you have a responsibility to pour into and to help form the life of young people around you. Each of us, by how we live and how we speak, are sending a message to the next generation around us of what it means to follow Jesus. Let me tell you something. This doesn't simply work by osmosis. It's not like they simply just kind of sit there and just sort of absorb everything magically, right? It's not like you, they're not like plants. You just set them out in the sun and give them some water. Friends, children and young people need to be urged, mentored, taught, poured into. They got to be shown how to walk and how to do these things. And friends, we're called to make disciples of all nations, and that begins with the young people right around us. And 
And I think this means at times, students and young people need to be addressed specifically and uniquely. And one of the things the church has done wrong is that they've made student ministry and ministry to young people really glorified babysitting, oftentimes, right? Well, we're going to send them off there, and they'll be okay because they've just got some good influences around them. No, when youth ministry is done right, we reach and we teach and we invest in the next generation around us. To use the words of Titus 2, Faithful youth ministry means training and urging them in their walk with the Lord. And not doing so as a replacement for their parents, but to come alongside and to reinforce and to strengthen and to encourage. And by doing so, we obey the great commission beginning with the lost closest to us. And one of the most important things your child needs is the local church. And I don't just mean once a month. Friends, I mean every single week. And I mean even beyond that, they need to be in a small group where they're connected and have life together. Friends, the world gets them the rest of the week. And friends, I don't know if you've been out in the world, it's kind of crazy out there. There's some wild stuff that they can hear and have access to. They're just a Google search away from anything. Friends, we need to have involved and invested Friends, the world is seeking to disciple them every hour. They're out there. Do we really think an hour in here is enough? Your child needs the church. And that means they need to be integrated into the life of the church. And that's one of the things we try to do. We've got young people involved and poured in. And we want to continue to do so. And we want to build a, a ministry culture where they're valued, they're poured into, they're strengthened. And they're taken seriously. Youth ministry is not primarily about dodgeball, but about disciple making. And then we can do some dodgeball while we're making disciples, right? Friends, they can be poured into and loved and served as a part of the body. One of the first things a child needs is a church. Second, children need to be taught to love Jesus. Children need to be taught to love Jesus. Notice verse 1 again. Children... Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. I think we're often far too easily satisfied. I think we often are, would be satisfied if we raised a child who just did everything we said. But we leave off the part about doing so in the Lord. I think many of us are tempted to be satisfied that if we raised a good, moral, upstanding citizen who shares our values and votes the way we do, we've done it, we've accomplished it, but what God desires for our children is far more than that. God desires that they be in the Lord, and that when they obey, they obey in the Lord. Not that they simply give obedience for obedience sake, nor that they simply have morality for morality's sake, but that, but that they do so because they love Jesus first and foremost, because they are in a relationship with Him. Remember, one of the central themes of the book of Ephesians is those two simple words, in Christ. Or Paul decides to lengthen it into three words, in the Lord. That when we follow Jesus by faith, we're placed in Him, in relationship with Him, in union with Him. And if we ultimately want what God wants for our children, then our desire is that they follow Jesus by faith and be found in Him. So often I think we get it reversed. I hear it all the time. Somebody will come and, and they're like, hey, I want my children in church because I want them to get the morals and the traditional values that I got growing up. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that on its face, but we've, get the, we've gotten the order backward. Because what your child needs, first and foremost, is not certain values. They need Jesus. And then the values will follow. They need a Savior ahead of morality. They need a right relationship with God before they'll live in right relationships with others. Because if they get that right relationship with Jesus, all the others will begin to follow. But sometimes we build up that if they just will live a good life and have these moral values and hold these things, but they get out in the 
world and they realize their foundation is shaky. They'll become far more susceptible to go, well, I'm just going to go with what's culturally hip and hot. What was culturally hip and hot when I was in Katie's was this, but now I live here and these people are doing this. They might even grow up to think that, well, if an adult tells me to do it, that means it must be right. Because there's no wrong adults out there anywhere, right? Or they'll say, hey, I should do this because everyone else around me is doing it. And friends, that's one of the dangers when they can grow up in church and they'll do it because everybody else is doing it. But then they'll get up and they'll go to Murray State where everyone else is doing some other things. And they'll go, well, I've learned to go with the flow. Friends, we need to teach them not to go with the flow, but to follow Jesus. And to love him first and foremost. This is where home and church actually are partnered in our goal together. Because so often over the years, there's kind of been this battle in, in broader church world against the home and the church. And who's responsible for a child's spiritual well-being, right? And the answer isn't either or, but both and, right? The family has a unique God-given responsibility. Verse 4 tells us that, right? Fathers, bring your children up in the instruction and the discipline of the way of the Lord, right? And in generations past, it's often been, well, I took my kid to church, I sent him to Sunday school, I put him in, in Awana and NRA, so who, who cares Who cares what, what I do at home? The church took care of all of it. Right? And that missed the responsibility of home, right, in pouring in these values. But I think sometimes we can have the pendulum swing so far the other way that they go, well, forget it at home. Who cares about the church? Who cares about other people? That can often be forsaken, forgotten, or even uh, misunderstood or downplayed. Because, friends, the Great Commission has been given to the church, to the local body of believers. To go, to baptize, and to teach everything Jesus has commanded. And that includes teaching children everything Jesus has commanded. So here at our church, I don't ever want us to treat home and church as opponents, but as partners. We work together. That's part of the things that any ministry we do to young people, we're not trying to replace the parents. We're trying to reinforce what they're hearing, support it, and come alongside them. And that's going to look different ways, different times. It looked different even in my five years of pastoring here. But ultimately, our goal is that children would love Jesus above all. And then if they get that relationship right, all the other relationships in life will begin to fall into place. Children need the church, and they need to be taught to love Jesus. Third, here's something real practical that comes out of this text. Children need simple, clear communication. Children need simple, clear communication. Look at uh, what Paul says, six, chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, for this is the first commandment of the promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. I love how straightforward Paul is here. And as we walk through Ephesians, we know Paul has the ability to take us deep. He was just talking about, just a few chapters ago, the unsearchable riches of Christ. That's quite a large topic to be addressed. But here, he speaks simply and clearly to a child. He understands that there's times to dive the depths of theological depth. And there's a time to simply say what clearly needs to be said. He says, children, do what your parents say, for this is right. Then he brings up the fifth commandment, right? Every parent's favorite. Honor your father and your mother, that you may that, that it may go well with you and you may live long in the land. Simple two-sentence instruction to get his point across. Did you notice Paul speaks to children differently than he speaks to adults? There's times I think we're tempted to, oh, to underestimate what our children hear and pick up, right? Let me say, look, we have children engaged in sitting in our Sunday morning service, and I think we will not often see the fruit of all that they're picking up until years down the road. But there is fruit they're picking up so much. But I also think there's times we overestimate the value of speaking on their level. I don't know about you, 
you, but every child I've met is very black and white. There's not a lot of gray, right? And speaking to them with clear communication. He doesn't necessarily put before the child needs for, for deep, mature introspection. I think we in the church place that on these children often. We'll take them off to children or youth ministry. We'll get them to camp. We'll get them all fired up. Right? We'll turn down the music. We'll play the soft ballad, you know, just as I am, you know. We'll have them walk down the front. We'll get them all worked up. And then we'll go, hey, you feel any different? Well, yeah. <laughs> you know? I don't know about you, but when I was young, I felt, if I had Taco Bell that day, I was feeling great. <laughs> right? Now, if I'm having Taco Bell that day, I'm feeling bad. <laughs> right? Because we often want expect them to have a level of emotional maturity and awareness that they don't necessarily have, right? And rather than trying to ask them, how do you feel? I've actually seen people ask this, do you feel like you know Jesus? What a terrible question to ask them. Rather simply lay before them the simple truths of the gospel and see the fruit as they come to believe them. We don't need to have them making decisions based on how they might emotionally feel in one moment to another. Also notice, Paul doesn't put his uh, instructions here up for debate. He does answer every child's favorite question. Why? Right? He does answer that. He says, why? Listen to your parents. He says, because God says so. And that settles it. Right? Simple, clear communication. And how we speak to our children is of such importance. They are not yet adults, and we need to be mindful of that as we're speaking to them. We also need to understand that they don't often understand the implications of things they do now down the road. Right? That's one of the things about being a child. They don't necessarily always understand cause or effect. They might be super curious about something or might even seem mature for their age, but that doesn't mean we need to give them unfettered access to anything they might be curious about. We still need to guide them, protect them, walk beside them. You know, you'll hear the phrase, it was just a phase. Let me tell you, I've seen a lot of people now that something started as a phase and grew into a lifelong problem later on. And it's our responsibility as adults and particularly as parents to communicate with them and to come alongside and to seek to help them understand in a way that only they can. And rather than expecting forecasting and the self-control of adults, sometimes we speak to children like they're just tiny adults. No, they often need clear, firm boundaries. Do this, don't do this. Simple reasons why it's right, it's wrong, it'll hurt, most importantly, because God says so. And I think this also relates to how we discipline. We need clear cause and effect, action, consequences, and we need to, and we need to be unwavering in those things and not confusing in how we apply them. So let me challenge you with all this. How have you communicated with your child this week? Have you begun the point of sort of trying to intellectually debate them to your position like you're talking to an adult about politics? Come on. <laughs> you know, has that ever worked before? Have you forgotten, maybe on the other side, what it's like to be a child? And from that experience, speak with firm conviction, but also with grace and with love. I know many of you work around students all day at your job. I know many of you work at the school, and you're like, man, I just got to come home. And you come home offering your family the leftovers rather than the first and the best. Ask yourself, how can I give them the first and the best rather than what's left at the end of the day? How are we speaking and communicating to the children in our lives? They need simple, clear communication. They need, as Ephesians 4 talked about, truth in love. Four, children need rewards, not just punishments. Children need rewards, not just punishments. Notice Paul pulls out the fifth commandment. It supports his point, right? Honor your father and mother. 
But he says at the end of verse 2, this is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. He says, you want to live a long time? Honor your father and mother. I don't think this is meant to be understood. Hey, if you don't listen to your father and mother, they're just going to kill you. I don't think that's what he's trying to communicate here. He is telling us, and this is a lesson even for us who may be out of the house, is that if we want to progress forward in our life, we need to look back at those who came before us and be willing to listen and learn from their advice and their mistakes, right? And he offers a promise to children who obey. How many of us have made our go-to motivator for our kids threats <clears throat> rather than promises? If you don't do that, if you don't, he doesn't say to listen to your parents or you'll end up in time out. He doesn't say, or but you'll have your favorite thing taken away if you don't do this. No, he says, obey your parents and you'll experience life. Now, I don't think Paul's saying there's never a place for timeouts, groundings, disciplines. Don't, don't mishear me. But he is giving us, I think, a helpful boundary, a helpful guardrail of what he's talking about in verse 4. He's talking about discipline, but he is saying that he's having us consider the power of rewards and promises even as we consider discipline and punishments. Especially as he turns from addressing children to addressing the parents. Look what he says in verse 4. I think this is so important. Fathers, and he has in mind mothers here too, so he's broadly parents. Don't provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. You want to know one of the quickest ways to provoke your children to anger is when they no longer see you as a parent, but as a police officer for the rules in their home. It's all about do, don't, do, don't, do, don't, and no relationship. You want to know how to provoke your children to anger? Let them feel like they're, you're never pleased with them, no matter what they do. Hey, they went and they cleaned their room, and the first thing you go in is you go in and you notice what they missed. Rather than going, hey, they did at least do what I said. Now let's work with them on some of the things. Rather than the first thing being, hey, you're not good enough. Friends, when they never feel like you can trust them, when they never feel and experience life with you and joy with you, even as they're trying to live with you, friends, that provokes them to anger. Have you ever considered the power of positive reinforcement? Have you ever considered the behavior-shaping power of the words, I am proud of you? Believe me, we can tell our kids all day long that we love them, but it's a whole different thing when they actually begin to believe it Amen. and understand it yeah. and walk and live out of it. When we invite them in to experience our love for them. I mean, sometimes doing something special with them when they haven't even asked. Maybe one thing you should do with your kids is you take them out and do something special with them. Just you and them, even if it's taking a walk. It doesn't have to cost money. But something just you and them to pour into one another. Seeking to show them that they shouldn't simply avoid consequences, but they should see the way of obedience as a way of life, as a way of relationship, as a way of experiencing the fullness of life together. And friends, let me, let me just say this. Guilt is typically a terrible motivator for change. Especially when that guilt is coming from the outside rather than maybe naturally from the inside. And, and I know, here's how we know this. We're coming up on a new year, and every new year, what do we do? We start to feel bad, so we're going to set those New Year's resolutions. How many of ours made it to February this year? Right? That inner guilt might get you to do some different behaviors, but it does actually create different attitudes and different long-term changes. Friends, guilt and shame will, will rarely motivate you, but gladness and security in one's love, now that's a motivator to obedience. And you know how we know that? 
Because that's how God calls us to obey. God doesn't say obey in order to receive my love. God gives his love to rebellious, far off people who didn't earn it, who, who don't do everything he asked them to do, and he gives himself even when it's undeserved. And that is a culture, this grace, this unconditional love that we got to build in our churches and in our homes. And that's the last thing that I want us to see. Children need the church. They need to be taught to love Jesus. They need simple, clear communication. They need rewards and not just punishments. And finally, children need spirit-filled parents. Amen. They need spirit-filled parents. Look at verse 4 again. Again, a challenge to mothers and fathers. Do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. I think there's a number of challenges that come out of this verse. First, it tells us that when we discipline, we should never discipline in anger. Some of y'all understand how easy this is. That child's on their nerves. Mm -hmm. Right? But friends, your anger toward them will only produce anger in them. That's right. We need the Spirit of God to fill us so that we have self-control rather than wrath. We must come. Sometimes it means we need to walk away from the situation for a little bit. Cool down, right? Talk to Jesus, right? We talk about having to come to Jesus with the kids. The adults need to come to Jesus sometimes, right? And we come to discipline with the goal of instruction, not the goal to let off our own steam. If you come away from discipline and only you feel better, that's not really the point of what we're here to do. This should challenge us second. That we should think about forgiveness and asking for forgiveness from our child when we fail. If you want to provoke your children to anger, I think I've said this several times, but it's so important. Never apologize to your child or extend or receive forgiveness. Friends, one of the telltale signs that you're not filled with the Spirit, but you're grieving the Spirit, is that you're hanging on to bitterness and unrepentance in your life. And we are tempted to do this to our kids as well. In fact, look back at Ephesians 4, verse 30. Paul says this. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit on which you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. He says, forgive. And you know what that means? Don't keep bringing up your child's flaws all the time. Exactly. Don't keep bringing up that, well, you know what you did to me? Keep a short record of wrongs. Don't keep putting the spotlight on their sins. And then especially don't get offended whenever they start to bring up some of yours. Uh-oh. That's how you provoke a child to anger, to bitterness, and frankly, to not want to become home at Thanksgiving when they get the choice of whether to come home or not. Do you know every command in the Bible about loving your neighbor applies to the little neighbors that live in your house and eat the food out of your refrigerator? There's a, there's a very simple rule. Treat your kids as you would want to be treated. And here's what that doesn't mean. That doesn't mean treat them as you were treated. Because many of us can perpetuate patterns because we parent the way we were parented. Rather, we should love and serve and apologize and forgive because that's what Jesus told us to do. And I think we should start it really, really, really young. You might sit and go, they're not going to remember that. Oh, yes, they will. I promise you, it will make such a difference in their life for them to see what do adults do. Think about this. You make a mistake, they're watching you, and they're watching you hunker down and not admit it and own it? What kind of a lesson is that? It's far better to come, confess our sin, own it, ask for forgiveness, and move forward in reconciliation. Think about what an example that would be. Do not grieve the Spirit. 
Do not provoke your children to anger, but rather be filled with the Spirit and raise them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Remember, Ephesians 5, when we're filled with the Spirit, we address one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. We make a melody in our hearts to the Lord. We give thanks to everything, and we submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And that means that the Spirit-filled family, we're going to speak about the Word of God together and instruct one another in it. It means that if you want your child to make following Jesus a priority, it's got to be more than a one-hour priority in your family. You need to talk about him around the dinner table. And as opportunities arise, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, you teach the Word when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. It means singing and giving thanks to the Lord. If you know gratitude is something that's caught not something that's taught. They will have as much gratitude as they see you display. So maybe this week, one of the ways you can begin to put this into practice is to put on some worship music in the car and sing together. Or, hey, sing a verse or two around the dinner table. Who are you trying to impress? Right? But to give thanks to God for everything in your life. And spirit-filled families it submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And our children, when the Bible has a one another, if your child's a believer, they're a part of that. And even if they're not, you still should be doing many of these things. And here's what that doesn't mean. Submitting to one another doesn't mean that the parent does everything the child tells them to do. But it also doesn't mean that you never listen to them. That you never give their concerns or likes to consideration. Rather, we should honor them in whatever ways possible. A spirit-filled family talks the talk of God's word and seeks to walk the walk of God's way. And they do it in life with their spirit-filled faith family who's also seeking to talk the talk and walk the walk. So that the young people around us aren't simply being instructed, they're, being, they're having a model for how the truth is to be lived out. They can say they've heard the truth spoken and they've seen a life lived in love. They'll say, I have seen this Jesus and more than the life of my parents, but I've seen it in a broader community who showed me and taught me what it means to follow him. Friends, every young person comes to the point where they ask the question, maybe my parents were wrong. And there probably are something that you might be wrong about. And the problem is sometimes they don't have the ability to go, they're wrong about this one thing, and they'll just start to peel and rip the whole thing off, right? They're wrong about everything, right? But it's a lot harder for them to sit and go, hey, my parents are wrong about this, but man, I remember these other adults that poured into my life. Look at, look at the same thing being displayed over there. It's a lot harder to tear a tapestry of testimony that a community of faith has given to them. Let me give you one last important lesson as we kind of land the plane here for parents through this whole parenting journey. As Jesus says, to follow after him, you must become like a child. Not childish, but childlike. There's a very big difference. Paul repeatedly says in the book of Ephesians, you are a child of God. And you're meant to walk out of that identity. And friends, that means adults, we have much to learn from the children in our lives. When's the last time you looked into the life of your child, saw what God was, and saw what God was teaching you about being a child of His? Friend, when was the last time you looked and we saw God at work in our child's life at all? Sometimes it means stopping, getting out of our head, and looking with eyes of faith. Because, friends, without parents, our children would be helpless, lost, broken, and destitute. And outside of Christ in a relationship with our Heavenly Father, that is true of you eternally as well. But the good news of the gospel is even though we are disobedient to our core, we have run away from a relationship with God. Paul says we're following the course of the world, the living engrossed in a family of sin and darkness. The Bible says God has a fatherly love for us. 
fact, the Bible says in love, he sought to adopt us into his family, and he paid the price to purchase us and to bring us into right relationship with him through the giving of his sinless son, Jesus. Jesus was the perfectly obedient son who gave his life so that rebellious people could be adopted into the family of God. Jesus died and rose again so that by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, we might become sons and daughters of the living God. You know, you're not born a child of God. John chapter 1 tells us this. But to all who did receive him, him being Jesus, who believed on his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You become a child of God not because your parents or your grandparents are Christians, and not because you did some religious ritual or you prayed a prayer after some guy. You become a child of God through placing your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ alone. Through a childlike faith in our Father like God. And when we place our faith in Him, we're adopted, we're welcomed into His family, and God sings over our life, This is my beloved child with whom I am well pleased. Friends, we all need to hear this message of the gospel. First, some of us need to hear it today because we need to take the step of faith to respond to the gospel and be adopted into God's family. Some of us are trying to ride into heaven and into a relationship with God on the coattails of our family or on a religious ritual that we performed. What we need is Jesus plus nothing. Are you a child of God? Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ alone? Are you walking out of that new identity and newness of life? You can be given, you can begin a new life in the family of God today by calling on his name. The Bible says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord would be saved. But parents, we don't need to hear the gospel simply so we can get saved or have our kids hear the gospel so they and yet say, no, we need the gospel because it takes a child of God to raise a child of God. The best earthly parents are the best heavenly children. And the more that we're reminded of the character of God and we seek to live in accordance with his word, the better parents we will be and the better we will serve and love the children around us. Jesus loves the little children all the children of the world, red, yellow, black, and white, they're precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. And may we be known as a church and as a people who love the children in our walls, in our families, and in the community and in the world around us. Let's stand and let's pray together. Father God, we are so thankful for the gift of children. We're thankful that, Lord, you've put so many godly adults in this church to pour into and invest into the next generation here at this church. And we're thankful as we think back of those who invested in the lives of us. God, may we see what an incredible blessing and stewardship and responsibility you given to us, whether we're parents or whether we simply know some parents. God, help us to live out our faith in truth and in love, to model it in community together, to invest in the next generation. And help us to look at our children and see what it means to be a child of yours. Today I pray if there's anybody here who's not been adopted into your family, who does not know you as Father, Lord, that they would call upon you today and you would meet with them right where they are and you draw them to yourself and they'd come to know you, love you, and serve you. And help us to see, Lord, that the better we live as children of God, the better we will serve the children that you have given to us. Bless us in all we do and in this response time, we ask and we pray this all in Jesus' name.